The Metal Gear series by the early 2000s was one of the most popular in the world. It had survived through multiple generations, revolutionizing storytelling and stealth gameplay, and everything came to a head with Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty, which is considered one of the greatest yet most polarizing games ever made. The gameplay is undeniably addictive, the inside jokes are darkly funny, the enemies are smarter than Einstein, and the graphics are clean and crisp, pushing the boundaries on what a video game can do, and is socially relevant today. It helped catapult the PlayStation 2 to commercial heights that no other system has reached, and it stood out among the rest of the classics from 2001. Unfortunately, not that many were comfortable with Raiden being the main protagonist. What? He has gotten more respect from fans over the years thanks to Metal Gear Rising Revengeance, but we were familiar with Salt Snake. Why change the protagonist to a blonde haired Mona? We're out here, we bleed, we die! and the plot itself came convoluted to the point of being downright pretentious, as if it was too smart for its own good, too ahead of its time. And this was meant to conclude the series, which was obviously not the case. After Sons of Liberty became the best selling title of the series even to this day, there was no avoiding it. Another sequel was inevitable. Hideo Kojima and his team moved to a new office where everyone worked together including the ones developing the remake of the first MGS for the Nintendo GameCube, the Twin Snakes. It allowed for ideas to be shared between each other, and Kojima wanted to recreate the same enjoyment he got from playing the first MGS, and in an interview, he was telling the fans everything they wanted to hear. It will be said in a jungle, the story wouldn't be as complicated, and there was only one protagonist which we were all familiar with. It means he's a man of his word. Well, sort of. After the events of Sons of Liberty, how can a jungle setting work? By traveling nearly half a century back in time during the height of the Cold War, espionage paradise. And instead of Solid Snake, we got someone who was biologically related, and if you're familiar with the MSX titles, it can only be one man. Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater was released for the PlayStation 2 on November 2004, and stayed exclusive for that console including the Subsistence Edition and 20th Anniversary Collection, until November 2011, when the HD Collection which included Snake Eater was released for the PlayStation 3, Vita, and Xbox 360. After the end of World War II, the world was split into two, East and West. This marked the beginning of the era called the Cold War. On October 16, 1962, the United States government discovered the Soviet Union preparing to deploy ballistic missiles from Cuba. John F. Kennedy demanded the Soviets to remove the missiles, but progress continued until the two nations eventually reached a deal on October 28, avoiding World War III. You mean the one where the US agreed to remove its IRBMs from Turkey? This was nothing more than a ruse. What they really wanted was Nikolai Sokolov, who previously defected to the states after developing nuclear weapons technology for the Soviets, and didn't want to do that anymore, holding the nation back. It was either give up Sokolov or risk full-scale nuclear war. In the end, we had no choice. Two years later, Intel came out that Sokolov was developing something big. A new super weapon tank, oh I wonder what that might be, and is seen as a bigger nuclear threat than the Cuban Missile Crisis. Nearing completion, Agent John, aka Naked Snake, part of the newly formed Fox unit, is sent to the Salino Yas jungles where Sokolov is being detained, and is tasked with rescuing him. After less than an hour, Snake was able to do just that. Until the boss, who was a mentor to Snake, and was just on the radio a few moments ago, arrives on the bridge in front of Snake with two nuclear shells, announcing that she's defecting to the Soviets, takes back Sokolov, and throws Snake off a bridge, severely injuring him. My place is with them now. While Colonel Volgan sets off one of the shells on the base they stole from to remove their traces, deeming the mission a failure. When the Soviet Union spotted the US aircraft that deployed Snake before the attack, this sparks another international incident, an inevitable nuclear war. Snake, it sounds like this could be even hotter than Cuba. I don't like it. Something about the whole thing stinks. Eventually, the two leaders hatch a deal where the US have a week to prove their innocence and finish off the people responsible. The higher-ups have decided that you're the only one capable of pulling this off. So after Snake heals from his wounds, he's sent back to the jungle to destroy the superweapon, rescue Sokolov, and stop Colonel Volgan's faction of emotions, and the boss, using radio assistance from Major Zero, Paramedic, Sigint, and ground assistance from Eva, Operation Snake Eater. Because I'll be taking on the boss in our Cobra unit, right? 
After playing through the predecessors, knowing that Solid Snake is related to Big Boss, who was an antagonist in most of that time period, it's a clever way to have a familiar face set half a century in the past during the Cold War. Knowing how he got the name, how he created Foxhound, and how he got that eye patch because it isn't there at the beginning. It's a perfect setting for the origin story of Big Boss, and I feel like I'm playing as Solid Snake again. As for the other characters, I'm not sure. It was cool to see a young Revolver Ocelot. I've been waiting for this. But most of the major characters are only there to complement Snake's part of the story. Maybe that was the point, because Snake Eater is chronologically the earliest in the timeline. It's a big boss origin story, and the other main characters later in the timeline, like Solid Snake, are the more important characters to think about. As I mentioned in previous reviews, what you see is footage of me playing it for the first time, because I didn't grow up with the Metal Gear series, which puts me in a unique perspective. But what stood out the whole time is the relationship between Naked Snake and the boss, and the theme, cultural relativism, meaning that soldiers will fight for the rest of their lives, but the rest of the world changes around them. Yesterday's good might be tomorrow's evil but they will always keep fighting. You see how this theme shapes all the characters in some way, especially Big Boss, who describes it to Solid Snake when confronting him in Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake. Having a prequel explaining where he got all his experiences and beliefs during the height of the Cold War, setting-wise, it's the right place at the right time. And because it's largely based on real-life events, you get a taste of what the 60s were like when two massive nations were fighting and it's a lot easier to understand. Your priorities never change. You have your objectives at the start, and you're stuck with them the entire game. But being Metal Gear, there's more going on than meets the eye. No pun intended. You only have to get your head around everything after the giant epilogue that seriously goes on for nearly an hour. It felt like the game ended, and restarted with another ending half a dozen times. Compared to Sons of Liberty, I still had an hour left and just gave up because it's a game. It's, it's a, a game, game just like, like usual. It's endless mind-bending twist distracted me too much from the gameplay. Maybe if I revisit it after completing the rest of the series, it'd make more sense. Some might think Snake Eater doesn't take as many risks, but it still has all the themes of conspiracy, war, and long cutscenes that made the predecessors so compelling, and it's kept me excited for another one of Big Boss's adventures. Leave it to me. It goes through 20 minutes of opening cutscenes before you even move, and the cinematic angles, the James Bond styled opener, the soundtrack composed by Harry Gregson Williams, the action, the standoffs, it's extremely entertaining to watch. The only serious issue I could find is that you can't pause these cutscenes if an outside distraction occurs, like a bathroom break or phone call, something like that. Which is inevitable if these cutscenes can go as long as 10 to 20 minutes. You'd think there was an option to pause it to avoid missing out on crucial information. Well, like TV, there isn't. Not even the PlayStation button does anything, and nor are there any briefings in the main menu. Let's just say neither one of us is going to be made a national hero out of this. So play this game like you're preparing to watch a movie or TV show, because there are a lot of cutscenes to dissect, and you won't have much of a chance to dwell on them. Kojima always wanted to set Metal Gear Solid in a more natural environment, and he did so in Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake where lots of different terrains were featured in the Zanzibar base, which was a drastic change from the outer heaven in Metal Gear. But there's something about Snake Eater that feels extremely refreshing. Even from a technical standpoint, this was nothing Kazunobu Uehara had ever programmed before because the jungle surface wasn't flat, trees moved around, animals randomly appeared in the wild, which I'll get to, and as you can see from the motion capture performances, they had to recreate scenes based on the level design, like this bridge for example. We know how good MGS titles on the PlayStation 1 and 2 look, so if Kojima says he and the team had difficulties, he meant it. But as you can see, they pulled it off. Sure, the first Metal Gear Solid was set in the snow, but most of it is indoors. In Snake Eater, at least 70% of the game is set outside the jungle or mountains. It feels more open and round, there isn't any music during gameplay immersing you as much as the cutscenes do, and it's structured in a linear way. Now I love the Metroidvania style gameplay in the predecessors where you need to gather certain items, but in Snake Eater, there were only two occasions when I had to backtrack and three occasions when I needed a key. But this means you have to keep coming up with new ways to get through these areas and still find certain items and weapons to either advance or make life easier. It feels less repetitive. It's dangerous to be out in the jungle at night without a guide. 
The third person camera view makes its introduction here. In previous MGS titles, the overhead view isn't an issue because the levels are designed for that camera view in mind, and so is Snake Eater which at first I couldn't understand because it's set in a jungle that isn't as square or flat. But it works somehow, it moves a little bit freely with the player, so cool. The reason Snake Eater initially kept the overhead view, according to Kojima, is because Metal Gear Solid, Sons of Liberty and Snake Eater was considered a trilogy where they all felt the same. Which makes sense, because like every title in the series that came before, Snake Eater was meant to be the last one. But the Subsistence Edition eventually added a third person camera view, and is also in the HD collection. It feels a lot less restrictive and has become the norm for future titles in the series. You can look around everywhere for enemies at a longer range, and it never feels like the environment goes beyond your control. Especially handy because there's no radar system. Well, technically there is, but it only detects enemy and animals by sound and heartbeat. It doesn't do that much. At first I hated it because I relied on the radar system so much in the predecessors, and occasionally I'd run into an enemy without indication that he was there. But it's something I've gotten used to. And there are no security cameras or drones, which doesn't make it any easier for the enemies. That's 1964 technology for ya. Naked Snake has the same moves as Raiden. You can crouch, roll, shimmy, jump up platforms, and the way you shoot guns, hold the action button, let go to fire, and letting go slowly disarms it, is exactly the same, so if you have a bad controller, you're not gonna have a good time. Apart from the third person camera view, it feels exactly like MGS2, which has some of the best stealth mechanics in a video game. There's a lot Snake can do. If I do have criticisms, and I do, they're only minor. Although Snake is built like a tank, he also moves like one. Apart from the end, as in one of the members of the Cobra unit, the controls are not designed for boss battles. For example, when you equip a heavy weapon, you can't move at all, and if you're rolling to avoid enemy attacks, it's easy to accidentally move into a prone position, turning you into a sitting duck. Though the third person view makes it a little bit easier. In addition to looking around in first person, it's automatically triggered whenever you crawl through the grass or tight spaces like tunnels or vents. This can be annoying because the reason you're crawling is to hide from enemies. You want to know where they all are. But because the first person view is locked on, the grass is in the way, so it's harder to know at times and moving around too much can alert enemies. Also, you can get stuck on a wall while crawling, and I get spotted almost every time it happens. Because like MGS2, the AI isn't stupid. Who's that? If you alert them, a stronger support team appears, and they look everywhere. Once again, the environment makes a difference. And when you eventually evade them, it takes even longer to stay hidden to the point of things being normal again. Or over two minutes just on the caution, with some moments taking as long as five minutes. What? <laughs> I get that guards would realistically take longer than that just to make sure that there isn't any intruder in a military base, but still, it'd be faster to just kill yourself and start again. It's also much harder to sneak up on them. In Sons of Liberty, I love hearing the line, Freeze. Huh? But no matter how silent your movement is, they just spot you. Okay, Freeze. sometimes you can get the upper hand, Freeze. Uh. but point is, I wouldn't bother with that approach unless you love the body slam. Although moving around is similar, the melee attacks are more diverse than Sons of Liberty. You can slam enemies to the ground, get them in a chokehold, gather information from them, or just finish them off. You can even bash them into a door, which is easy to do by accident. Another excuse to stay silent, I guess. The team were once again trained by a military instructor to get the most authenticity in the performances and the correct movements of a real soldier, particularly in the melee department. I just keep putting them to sleep with a the tranquilizer. There'll be a few occasions when it'll take more than one attempt to sneak through an area or win a boss battle. It's about figuring out the correct routine, and it feels very satisfying when you do. Got you this time. To keep quiet, you need plenty of suppressors because in this game, they have limited use. But at least they can be picked up from enemy guards in other hidden areas. You could say that the guards are the ammo containers. Different weapons vary from pistols, heavy rifles, snipers, rockets, grenades, basically all the weapons from the predecessors but with different names because it's set half a century earlier. And like I said before, the controls to fire them differ from your typical first person shooter. 
I never found a use for grenades or explosives in Snake Eater, partly because it's possible to beat this game without alerting any enemies, partly because I found myself becoming very proficient with the M22 from long range, and partly because I hate waiting for the caution countdown to end. Also the items are just as useful as the predecessors, yet not as many including night vision, thermal vision, binoculars, the aforementioned radar system with a battery pack that connects to all technology in your backpack which I admit is very clever. because it goes down the more you use it, and fake death pills which are funny to use. It's like, ah, oh, game over. Gotcha! Another example of this game's fourth wall breaking humour. Be careful or you'll create a time paradox. And this wouldn't be a Metal Gear title without something to smoke, which Snake obviously finds a proper use for. In the main menu when starting a new game, you're given a choice of which Metal Gear Solid game is your favourite. I know it's not a difficulty option because that's what you select after this. The only thing I noticed at first was that selecting MGS2 starts you as Raiden, or so I thought for a second. Time for the snake to shed his skin. I get to also keep the mask and use it for other situations. Had I known the differences between these four options, I probably would have selected I like MGS3, because you will receive more camouflage options at the start. Because the map is diverse, by that I mean you must explore jungles, rainforests, deserts, snow and indoors, there are a lot of areas completely different from one another. But one thing you have to do frequently is blend in, which is rated by percentage. These camouflage options include different coloured uniforms and face paint which affect the percentage based on where you are on the map. Like if you put on forest colours and hide in the grass, the number is high, but random colours and running around making noise will lower it. The higher the percentage, the harder it is for enemies to see you. It's unusual that you can carry so many of these things without a physical backpack, but like the weapons, who cares? You're limited to how much you can carry during gameplay, and this goes separate for items, food and weapons. You're a ghost snake in every sense of the word. But the biggest change from the predecessors is the stamina bar, which affects all aspects of gameplay depending on how you manage it. It affects the way you aim your weapon, oxygen levels when underwater, how long you can hang on for, and enemies can hear your stomach rumble when it's too low. There are certain moments when full stamina is required, and to fill it you need to eat food. In the predecessors you kept your health in check with rations you find in a base. Straightforward as it sounds, but here health regenerates, and it's the stamina bar that needs replenishing. You can find food from enemies in fridges, but the wilderness is a more dependent source. The knife is used for hunting fruits and animals, including snakes, living up to the game's title. Pretty tasty. Food has varying levels of stamina, which are only discovered when Snake tries them for the first time. Just make sure you can eat as soon as you can, because food can go rotten, make you sick and require self-treatment, which is another factor in affecting stamina. Yeah, you can actually get sick from eating expired food, catching colds, or being bitten by venomous animals, as well as injure, cut or burn yourself. If any of these things I just mentioned happen, you need to treat yourself using medicine and surgery. I remember reaching the tutorial for this part and I thought, that's it. There's no way I can get my head around everything. But when your health goes down, that's when instincts kick in. It's obvious when part of the health bar turns red, and it tells you exactly what to do to fix a wound or sickness if you're unsure. Yes, it takes a lot more time, but it doesn't happen as often as you think. Health regenerates, and food and medical supplies are easy to come by. Basically, it may look too complex on the surface, but it isn't, at least compared to the predecessors. And you can't say it doesn't make sense. The only time it's a nuisance is during boss battles when all of them have an attack that requires some sort of medical attention. Funny how Snake can cure himself in the middle of a battle. I actually played the prologue over a year ago thinking I was going to review Snake Eater as soon as I finished Sons of Liberty, but for some reason I changed my mind. Did I see a year? What took me so long? Why'd you disappear on me all of a sudden? Better late than never, I guess. But now that I've returned to this game, what's really surprised me is how easy it is to comprehend. You need at least an hour or two, but it's more than worth it. Maybe it's because I've beaten the predecessors in the past and it's come back to me faster than I expected. Along with the extra elements like eating food, keeping yourself injury free, and camouflaging into the environment to avoid being spotted, it's hard to stop playing this game, even if a huge chunk of it is taken up by cutscenes. But that's what Metal Gear is all about. <laughs> 
And if you pay attention, Metal Gear is about little details, easter eggs and inside jokes too, which occasionally affect gameplay. Like this cave for example. At first it's only 1% visible, but after a few minutes it becomes slightly brighter because naturally, our eyes adapt to the darkness. When Snake gets his eye patch, his vision isn't as clear when entering first person. If you kill Ocelot in the Virtuous mission at the beginning, it creates a time paradox, but also an achievement trophy. He's still young. And there's one boss where if you save it and leave the game for a week or change the clock on your console, he dies of old age. You mean you kick the bucket in the middle of a battle? People say it can take hours to beat him, but on my first try it took just over half an hour. It's a fun boss battle actually. Typically if you do things in a video game you're not supposed to, like being able to leave the map or gain an unfair advantage, normally this is a sign that it's broken or glitched. But instead, it's designed for things to be discovered, making it worth laughing at without making the game too easy in advance. Sometimes you have to think outside the box, and it's one of the main reasons why the series is known for its high quality. Most of the humorous features are in the subsistence edition exclusive to the PlayStation 2, like the secret theater, ape escape minigame Snake vs Monkey, or even an edited version of the story made up entirely of cutscenes. It even includes Metal Gear Online, where players converse each other in typical online battle modes like Deathmatch, Capture the Flag, etc. Unfortunately, servers shut down after just a couple of years. Now I know the Phantom Pain has an online component still active as of this review, and I don't have any interest in online multiplayer, but it's a shame that the online part of MGS3 didn't last that long, nor does it exist in the HD collection. The Ratchet & Clank HD collection kept its online component from up your arsenal, and servers shut down as recently as this year. Imagine how long and popular Metal Gear Online would have been in that HD collection. That's what bothers me about the remastered version of Snake Eater. Most of the features from Subsistence aren't here, which I'll elaborate further in a future review of the HD collection. At least it's 720p, 60 frames per second, and it comes with these games too. The only thing in the collection it does have from Subsistence, apart from the third person camera view, are the games Metal Gear and Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake, which originally came out for the MSX2 computer exclusively in Japan, and the Subsistence edition marked it the first time they got a worldwide release, nearly two decades later. Kojima initially didn't have plans to release them because he thought they've aged badly. He must have changed his mind. These were my introduction to the series, and Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake in particular, it's a travesty it was never released for the NES, because it would have been one of the top 10 best games for that system, no question about it. But then again, looking at Metal Gear on the NES, it wouldn't have been translated properly. And we did eventually get them, and in order to play these, you need this masterpiece to get access to them. Win-win. There's a reason why so many rank Snake Eater as the best in the Metal Gear series, and I'm one of them. Yeah, I said it. Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater is one of the best games I've ever played, and I've said this about almost every single Metal Gear title. They really are video gaming excellence. Commercially, it wasn't on par with Sons of Liberty selling 4 million copies, which is still very successful, but other gaming franchises had established themselves on the PlayStation 2 by 2004. For example, in the span of a month, Sons of Liberty and Grand Theft Auto 3 came out for the PlayStation 2, but the Metal Gear series was more recognizable thanks to the first MGS on the PlayStation, which generated more hype. However, by the time Snake Eater came out, San Andreas was the biggest game in the world. The attention was obviously still on Metal Gear, just more so on others. A lot of other franchises were just as popular on the PlayStation 2 at the time, and for a while, Snake Eater was exclusive to that system while Sons of Liberty also came out for the PC and Xbox. The attention to detail put into these games are unlike anything I've ever experienced. Snake Eater has everything in the predecessors I'm familiar with that came back to me after an hour of gameplay while trying a lot of new things like camouflage, treatment and close quarters combat. Everything comes together perfectly and because it turns down the fourth wall breaking and subtle foreshadowing confusion from Sons of Liberty and is chronologically the earliest in the timeline, you can make the argument that this is the most casual friendly, as in the one to play first if you're new to the series. But whether you're playing it for the first time or not, this is a spectacular way to begin the story of Big Boss, and I can't recommend it enough. You're missing out if you haven't played it yet, just like I did.